Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about diagnosing and treating migraine. And I wanted to begin actually by uh, talking about how migraines are very common, but they are underappreciated. And anyone that's experienced migraines probably feels this way because this idea that, well, no one really understands what I have, but the reality is these are very common. Um, so this is actually a, uh, I don't, don't have a pointer, I guess I can use this, but anyways, this was actually from the American Migraine Foundation, and now it's estimated that about 36 million Americans, at least, well, now the number is about 40 million Americans suffer from migraine headaches. Uh, that's pretty common, and about half of migraineurs, <laughs> who are basically migraine patients, migraineurs, uh, are undiagnosed. So many a times patients will see their doctors or tell them they have headaches, but they don't actually receive that diagnosis of migraine. Just to show you how uh, common it really is, uh, this is coming out kind of small, but it's the, set, the World Health Organization in 2010 identified migraine as the seventh most disabling disease worldwide. Disabling disease. And amongst women, it's the fourth leading cause of disability worldwide. It's common. And just to compare migraine with diabetes, which we know is very common, and high blood pressure and asthma, you can see in women, uh, there is uh, a significantly higher likelihood of developing migraine headaches than there are diabetes, asthma, hypertension that we normally see our doctors for and that are generally appreciated in society. So uh, this, is, this is news to a lot of people, that, a lot of patients that I see actually. Um, not only are they very common, they're very expensive. Very expensive for patients, they're very expensive to the health system, they're very expensive to society as a whole. Uh, if you look at the cost um, in 2008, this is not 10 years ago, so obviously the numbers have shifted up. $11 billion were spent on inpatient or outpatient care, clinic visits, ER visits, and prescriptions in one year alone. Um, and the three month cost for a patient is about $1,000 on average for someone that suffers from chronic migraine and about three to $400 for someone that suffers from episodic migraine. And I'll explain the definitions shortly. So it's very common, it's very expensive. So it only makes sense that we as a society identify it better, we appreciate it better, and then we learn to treat it in, a, in an effective way that's for the betterment of our patients and certainly in a cost-effective way as well. $13 billion of indirect costs to employers in missed work and decrease productivity. $13 billion to employers. So this is not just affecting you, it's affecting the companies that you work for as well. And then that affects, of course, the entire society. And so this is why there's this tug, and, tug, tug of war. Now, like Dr. Zaverblis had mentioned, a migraine isn't just a headache. You know, we think about tension headaches as really being a headache. It's in the side of the head, 90% of us are gonna experience it, but a migraine is far more than a headache. And I'm just gonna show you this uh, depiction here. This is a typical patient that has migraine. You can see here that number one, her eyes are closed. Why? Because she's sensitive to light. Uh, number two, she's holding one side of her head. Migraine headaches tend to be on one side. They can switch over to the other side, but they usually are, um, they usually are one side or the other. Um, you can see she's sensitive to noise, um, and at least the artist had mentioned that she's speaking in a low voice to avoid aggravating pain. When you see someone that's in the middle of a severe migraine attack, they don't really raise their voice, they talk kind of low because their own voice irritates them and certainly the voices of other people as well. They just want to be left alone by themselves in a dark, quiet room. So this is a, a nice depiction of that. Now, it's not difficult to diagnose, as difficult as we may make it seem. Uh, the average person can actually diagnose this. It's just very straightforward. If your headache tends to be more one side than the other, you probably have migraine. If it lasts for several hours to days, there's a good chance that it's migraine. If it is associated with either a, sens a sensation of feeling nauseous or even vomiting or just feeling sick to your stomach, it's probably migraine. If you become ultra sensitive to your surroundings, that could be light, that could be noise, that could be smells, that could be children, that could be your in-laws, it could be anyone. If you become more sensitive than you normally are to these uh, individuals, then uh, it's a possibility during your headache, not just in general. During your attacks of migraine, then it's, it's possibly a migraine. And migraineurs, like Dr. Zaverbalist mentioned, it's worse uh, with moving around. A migraine just wants to be left alone by themselves in a dark, quiet room. Other types of headaches don't have this very characteristic feature. Um, and as she had mentioned, migraineurs can have aura. So as you can see, there's, there's more than just head pain involved in someone that has migraine headaches. Um, the aura itself is very interesting. You can see this uh, graph. Uh, there's the prodrome that Dr. Zverbalis mentioned, there's a the headache itself, and then the postrome. But the aura occurs, we say, within an hour before the headache. And aura for every person can be different. These are just some examples of aura. 
Um, some of you may experience something like this. It's the same age image. Some people experience zigzag lines. Some people experience sparkles of light in their vision. It begins and then it sort of expands over the course of uh, minutes. This is, again, the same image. Some people, from one side of their vision, they begin to see something coming across. To some people, it's dead center. And this is very bothersome because when they're on a computer at work, they can't work. If it's on the side or if it's coming from the top or down, you can continue to work for those few minutes as the clock runs out on you. But when it's in dead center in your central vision, it's very difficult to function. I actually have patients that uh, will tell me that their aura is more disabling than the headache itself because it comes in the way of their function. They can live with their headache or they can function with their headache, but when, that, when their visual symptoms start, they feel very disabled. And then, of course, these are, I guess, fireworks and, and vision. So it could, it could vary. Um, some people experience, like Dr. Zverbalis mentioned, uh, tingling down one arm. Some people develop um, difficulty with speaking. These all occur, generally speaking, before the headache actually begins within that hour. Um, everyone's aura is unique to them. Uh, and we have our patients often draw their auras. In fact, there's competitions and things. This is one of my patients, of course, without any patient-sensitive information. This is her aura. So what she sees is this. And it's only when she sees people, not other parts of the environment. It's only when she sees people that their body parts are displaced. The eyes are shifted toward one side. Both arms are on one side. The nose will be on the opposite side. And um, what does it look like? Oh, so, uh, I'm sorry? Uh, Picasso. 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 Yeah. And in fact, she told me my aura are just like Picasso paintings. So I was like, very interesting. So uh, this, is a, this is something that we discuss. It's in the literature, and we've discussed this at conferences as well. It's very unique. This is actually a Picasso photo. Um, and it's actually amusing to her, because sometimes she'll be sitting in a meeting, and then she'll develop the aura, and now all of her colleagues look like that. And so she'll have to refrain from, uh, from actually laughing. So um, this is her aura, and everyone's aura is unique to them. So now once we've made the diagnosis, very straightforward, one-sided headache, some nausea, you want to be left alone by yourself, and the pain is usually pretty bad. Um, the big question that if you ever see a headache specialist or a neurologist, about, we always ask about how often are your headaches? How many days a month do you have them? And my patients almost never understand why I ask the question, because to them it's like, what do you mean? I, I've been having one for the last two weeks. But no, no, I need to know how often on average you have headaches. The reason is because we make this distinction. Maybe it's arbitrary to you, but for people that are doing research, um, it matters how many days in a month you have headache. And we usually divide it between 15 days a month, uh, less than 15 days a month, or 15 or more days a month. It matters because it puts you into two different categories. You're either someone that has episodic migraine, which is the majority of patients, or someone that has chronic migraine. Episodic migraine are headaches that are less than 15 days a month, without going into too many details. And chronic migraine are headaches that are more than 15 days a month, and at least 15 of those days are actually migraine-type headaches. So some, I'm sure some of you have migraines. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But if you have migraine, I'm sure you have headaches that are migraines and then headaches that are not really that bad. Right? So um, th those are the total headaches that we would include. So we make this distinction because, number one, it helps us understand the cause of your headaches, and it can help us understand how better to treat your headaches. Are you someone that has episodic or chronic migraine? Now, once we've made that diagnosis, we've identified that these are migraines. We know if you're someone with an episodic pattern or a chronic pattern. So we understand the physiology of the brain and why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. Then we actually begin treatment. Treatment is very interesting for migraine because we have so many treatments. There's acute treatments. Those are treatments that you use when you're in the middle or when your acute migraine attack starts. It starts and then you treat. We call those acute treatments. And then you have preventive treatments. And those are medications that you would take or some sort of treatment that you would use to help prevent the headaches from developing altogether. And then we have, we have what we call rescue treatments. And I use the term rescue because this is what some practitioners use. I don't know if you use it. Sometimes I do as well. That if someone's having a headache that's not responding to their usual treatments, acute and preventive, and they have a bad headache for one or two weeks, what do we do to try to save them and rescue them from that intractable headache? Um, I like to think about this acute and preventive, especially in light of like blood pressure, right? If someone's blood pressure spikes up, you have something that you could do acutely. Usually in the ER, they'll give you an IV and they'll bring your blood pressure down. That's something to get you through. But then there's also this daily medicine that you take because the goal is to keep your blood pressure at bay for an extended period of time. Headaches are, are very similar. So let's talk a little bit about acute treatment because whether you're someone that has episodic migraine or chronic migraine, you have a migraine once a year or you have a migraine once a month or once every hour, 
which is not really possible, but once a day, let's say, you are gonna have some sort of acute treatment. So what are the acute treatments? Now, most patients that have not seen a neurologist, I should say most patients that have not seen a doctor, uh, usually resort to just the non-specific treatments because they're available over the counter. These are treatments that reduce pain through general pain pathways. All kinds of pain can be treated with this, and usually you'll find this over the counter. And this is stuff that you may be familiar with. Then there's specific treatments for migraine, and these treatments are specifically targeting migraine pain pathways. What are the nonspecific treatments? These are stuff that you can usually get over the counter, but there's also some prescriptions. There's Tylenol or acetaminophen, NSAIDs, so ibuprofen or Aleve or um, uh, aspirin, combination analgesics, so this is where you combine different meds and to put it in one pill, something like Excedrin, the trade name. Uh, there's some anti-nausea or prescription medications and some that you can actually get it over the counter at the store. Uh, there's our, obviously opioids and barbiturates, narcotics, um, and we'll talk about that uh, shortly, and then muscle relaxants as well. Now, these target general pain. So you could take most of these medications and you could fix your back pain, your knee pain, you could fix your, uh, you could, you know, you could uh, fix pain during child labor for that matter. But, uh, but there's a lot more than that. In fact, oftentimes I see patients and they'll come to the clinic and say, Doc, I've tried literally everything under the sun, nothing's working for me. And I ask them, what have you tried? And they'll usually say, I tried Tylenol, I tried ibuprofen, I tried Aleve. I said, you've barely scratched the surface. You've barely scratched the surface. There's an ocean of treatments available. And if you've only resorted yourself to what you can find at, over the counter at your local pharmacy uh, or your local grocery store, then you really haven't even touched what's available for patients that have migraine. We tend to use um, uh, treatments that are specifically targeting migraine pain pathways because the pathways are different altogether. Now, while some of these will work, you know, sometimes Excedrin does work for a migraine, sometimes ibuprofen will work, we tend to need some of the stronger medications. So there's triptans, which are what we consider kind of first line for someone that has bad migraine headaches. Uh, there's dihydroergotamine or DHE, which is available not just in IV formulation, but also in, um, in uh, in injection form and also in the form of nasal sprays, uh, and then ergotamines. In terms of triptans, these are the first line treatment for someone that has migraine. We like to think of it as first line because it seems to work better than anything else we have. There's sumatriptan, rizotriptan, and the list goes on. How do we choose which one we want to use for our patients? Well, it's a conversation. Each one seems to work just as well as the next, but some seem to have different side effects. For one, uh, one, one of them, for instance, will make you feel sleepy. One of them will make you feel like you're having chest pain and you're having a heart attack. Some people are deathly afraid of that. One of them will make you feel a little bit more nauseous. So whichever one is the most bothersome, we avoid it. Whichever one you don't mind having, we recommend that medication. And some of them tend to last a little bit longer. So depending on how quickly it'll work and how long it'll last, we make a decision ba uh, based off of these seven. Now, some patients can't use triptans. Most patients can, but some cannot. And usually it's patients that have problems with blood vessels elsewhere in the body. So if you've ever had a heart attack in the past or a stroke, if you have blood pressure that's quite uncontrolled, if you uh, have complicated migraines, these are very rare, but there are certain rare types of migraines where, for instance, you become weak on one side of the body or you become, um, you have difficulty or you start slurring your speech. We tend to avoid it in this class, but these are very rare forms of migraine. Um, uh, Pregnancy, it depends. For the most part, we try to avoid it, but in someone that has bad migraines and don't respond to other treatments, we will sometimes use it for pregnancy, during uh, pregnancy in conjunction with, uh, uh, or after seeking advice of the OB physician as well. Uh, 